Let's take a look at another random control module from eBay. And this is an actuator for use with air ducts. The listings for these, and there's lots of them, tend to describe it as 220 volt actuator for air damper valve electric air duct motorized damper wind. Uh, the information is very vague. I could not find data on this for the actual use of it. And the text is so small that the translation app just struggled a wee bit with actually even identifying what it was. I used a zoomed up image and it gave me a line of text, which was no help at all. It gave me a rough idea of the indication uh, of what it did, but uh, not really a decisive indication of what it does. So it has a connector on it and it has three connections. I opened it up and end and worked it out. It was actually a lot uh, simpler than I was expecting. I was thinking it was going to be like one of our water control valves that has the spring return motor with uh, a switch output and uh, DC braking inside. Our water valves are quite complex that way. This is not complex. This has a motor and two switches. So let me show you what this does first and then I'll power it up, show you operating, then we'll open it up. So the idea of this is, and I shall zoom down this a little bit, that if you have an air duct with air flowing through it, you can have a metal plate, a round metal plate in that duct that rotates to actually block or allow the air to flow through. And initially I was thinking, well, it's going to take quite a lot of force if that's quite high pressure, but it's quite a clever idea because if this is rotating that direction, you'd think this would be pushing back against the air. But in reality, while it is, the other side is being pushed by the air, so it takes a lot of the pressure off it. And all that does is then rotate to that position there, and it means it can open and close quite easily, even with quite strong air flows. That is more or less it. The schematic for it, I'll show you the schematic before I even show you it working, because it's incredibly simple. There's a synchronous motor, it's non-directional. It's one of those bi-directional ones that uh, just stalls against the end of travel. I was thinking there's going to be capacitors in here for direction when uh, I didn't detect that there was a spring-loaded return. And what actually happens is that you've got a common going to the motor, which is rated 4 watts. I guess they do these in other voltages. I'd expect them to do them in 120 volts, 24 volts. But you've got a live for the open and a live for the close, and, and the close and they go via end of travel switches so that when the motor gets, say for instance, you power up, say, open, the motor will wind in that direction until it hits that switch. And when it does so, it kills power to that. It's worth mentioning, though, that during that time, this connection, which is not being used, is actually live. So I'm going to have to be careful while I play about with this because uh, the wire that is not connected will become live. But uh, to get the change of direction, if you then... At disconnect the open and you connect the close to actually move it to the other position. The motor, it's stalled against that position. It can't go in that direction, so it runs in the other direction. But if it's in a mid position, it will actually run in a random direction. So supposing you wanted it to close, it will actually, and it was in the mid position, it might either go straight over to the closed position or it might go to the fully open position, hit the end of travel limit, reverse, and then come over until it hits that switch. And likewise, if you powered both these it will just go backwards and forwards continually because it's getting fed power all the time that is it it's not complicated let's demonstrate it operating by stuffing live wires into connections so i'll stuff a bit of blue tack down here because this is a little actuator bit and i'll use this opener thing as an arrow and i shall just stick that onto there i shall bring in the cliff quick test a piece of electrical test equipment and I shall put that wire in there don't know which wire this is I'll just stuff it in and the other wire I shall um, basically tuck out the way so I'm not going to I'll just put my my snips on it like that and when I power it up it's going to do something it hit the end of travel now it's going to that position and it will stop when it gets to the fully closed position I guess that's it right now if I connect the other connection and I just place this out here so I don't get zapped it's gone in the wrong direction initially stalled and now it's going over to the other direction and that is it 
it's not that sophisticated. Now I'll show you what happens if you just connect both up and it does its little dance backwards and forwards. So I'll stuff this wire in here. People always ask, this is the Cliff Quick Test. It's a really common, it's designed for test workshops. It's got a neon indicator show, to show it's active, but it's got blade terminals in here and a fuse. And uh, when you open it up, it disconnects both alive and neutral. But when you close it down, it makes connection so that these things can be tested. So this thing is now going to travel to its fully open position. And then it's just going to stall against the end of travel, uh, reverse and go to the other position. Makes a slight humming noise, goes in the opposite direction. Doesn't really draw much more current. It draws a consistent four watts when it's in motion. And that is it. Okay, we have seen it running. I shall disconnect the wires and we shall open it up. The Chinese data sheet says it's rated for 50,000 cycles. It's made of plastic. That casts doubt into my mind. Let us unplug the connector. It's nice, they've got a little Phoenixy type connector here and pull off my bit of blue tack and arrow. There we go, that's uh, that out the way. Grab a screwdriver and open it up. So there are four screws holding this closed. You'll notice this is curved, it's, I guess. It seems quite a ungenerous curve. You, I mean, it seems quite a tight curve. You'd think it would actually be quite a soft curve for the whatever it's designed to clamp onto. I don't know if that's just a perfectly engineered curve that matches many things, or if it's got adapter plates for different ducts. I was expecting this plate to protrude a little bit further, just for extra support. It seems to kick over at an odd angle when it reaches end of travel, and the motor is stalling against the switches. I think it stalls against end stops next to the switches. I don't think it uh, puts strain on them directly. What we have inside is a fairly standard synchronous motor on two little spacers here. This thing, what sort of a uh, core does it have in here? Can I get that off? It's jammed on quite tightly. Uh, let's pull it off anyway. Let's pull it off. Is it going to come off? Or it might be really jammed on very tightly. I don't think it's screwed on. Hmm, maybe not. Oh, there's a pin. Right, okay, well that's why that wasn't coming out in a hurry. They've put a locking pin in here, so yes, righty up, that's that then. That'll be why my efforts were in vain. So, putting this back together again. There are the two end of travel switches. The two motor connections, one of them is coming over to here, then a wire link is going over to the other side, the other one is going round to the common connection, then they've just used bits of tin copper wire, it looks a bit shonky, uh, but they've used those to bridge to the switches, and that is it. It's the two little switches, uh, and I can to what I said, there aren't end stops, it really is actually just stalling hard against those uh, switches. Shall we zoom down in this? Shall we power it up again? Yes, we shall, and we'll see it stalling. I shall just grab the connector here. I shall stuff this little connector in. There's another thing. The connector here is literally just, uh, it's a printed circuit board connector, but they've put it through the holes here and just soldered it in place. I suppose it works. This is made very cheaply. As many very popular industrial components are, let's zoom down in this. This is not going to be very bright, is it? Let's brighten up a bit as well, can we? Just saturate it a little bit, just so you can actually see that uh, that arm, right? Tell you what, let's get the neutral in and the two lives, and we'll just power it up so it does its little dance again, and we'll see it smashing those switches into pulp when it reaches the end of travel. Begin the destruction. So the distortion there, the slight movement over is just the plastic flexing, I guess. That's probably the most destructive bit. Slight 50 hertz means hum off that. Uh, that's it. How simple is that? It's all it needs to be. But there we go. That is the... I'll just zoom back out. This is going to be super saturated now. Zoom out. Tame it down. Uh, but that is it. 
the very common, these things are about 10 pounds. That'll probably translate to 10 euros and 10 dollars, given how things normally work out. But the very common actuator for air damper. I could see it having other applications. Make a little 3D printed adapter, a little cube in here and uh, put it on various things that will let you actually put it to two positions. But quite neat. Quite a smart little mechanism. Super simple. Just how things should be.